All right, so we left off last week somewhere around verse 21, but I'm going to back up a little bit. We're just going to, we're not going to get into six at all tonight. So when I finish chapter five, um, this is a section that, that it's just n- not a good idea to rush through. So we kind of rushed through part of um, it last yesterday, six through 21. So I'm going to kind of go back over it a little lightly and then pick up where we left off. We left off, um, we stopped before verse 22 last week. Now, again, just every week, just by way of quick review, and I think you guys, I'm seeing the same faces on Wednesday nights. You guys are now starting to understand the theme of the book of um, Galatians and really where it's at. And again, in a nutshell, everywhere that Paul went, there would be a group of folks that would follow Paul, and they were the Jesus plus folks. Now, we know that as soon as you say Jesus plus anything, it's a cult, it's a schism, ism, it's a problem. It's Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And, and you, you know, if you ask somebody, how do you know you're going to heaven? And they say, my faith in Jesus plus uh, I'm a good person or plus anything, there's a problem, right? If somebody asks you how you're going to heaven, you're not a plus person. You're I'm going to heaven by, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And it's just only by the finished work on the cross that I'm saved. I can add nothing to it. I can take nothing away. Now, these folks were saved folks. They were, we call them, they've been nicknamed or named in history Judaizers. And the Judaizers became Christians. They weren't against Jesus. They weren't against necessarily Paul's teachings. But they, they were trying to get people to add to Jesus the works of the law, specifically um, the big things within Judaism, which are circumcision, kosher laws, these things. So they were coming in after Paul. They were saying, you need to be circumcised. And Paul is absolutely gloves off in the book of Galatians against these folks. Do you remember last week he said, if, if you're going to be circumcised, you might as well cut it all off. And I wish that you, you know, you would just finish it. And he is not pulling punches with them. Now, when we get in, and the book of Galatians does break up kind of nicely into chapters one and two, chapter three and four. Now, as we get into five and six, as, as it really customary with Paul's writings that, um, really just makes him phenomenal is, is the application part, the practical part. Now, when we get into five and six, we get into this, this area of now that we're not bound by the law, that, that the law has no bearing over our life as Christ followers, that we're not a religion, we're a relationship. And, and really, we're the only group in the world, I think, that would fancy ourselves as not a religion, but a relationship. Everything else is religion, and it's, it's a works. It's people reaching up um, to God, trying to, trying to do works to earn position with God. And, and our position with God, our relationship with God, drives our works and not vice versa. We have to keep the, heart, the horse in front of the cart and understand that we do good works not to get saved. We do good works not because we have to. We do good works because we want to, because we get to, because we have relationship with Jesus. And it drives us to want to serve him. And, and um, there is some, some um, um, self-gain in it. It's okay to be a little... Um, thinking of ourselves, and in some respect, I don't see how to get around it, that we're earning reward. And that, that the Bible says that there's a reward for works and that there's rewards for you in heaven. And, and so, you know, part of our motivation as we do those things under the Lord is that we believe that we're sending as Jesus treasures up to heaven, that, that rust doesn't destroy and thieves don't break in and steal and moths don't eat, and that there is a reward for our works in heaven. Some, some folks say, oh, well, you, you can't do it for the reward because that's a bad motive. And I'm like, well, I don't necessarily do it for the reward. But, to, but the idea of reward is very biblical. Jesus talked about reward often. And many times you can come to places where the New Testament talks about the idea of reward. And so I always have it in my mind. And it's just, it's just is what it is. Of course, I want to do it, again, born out of relationship and love for Jesus. So chapter 5 begins this new um, topic called Christian Liberty. And again, it's summed up in the idea that as Christians, we have liberty. Um, In the ESV and in in other versions, um, chapter 5, verse 1 reads, For freedom you have been set free. Um, The the New King James reads, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made you free. So Christ has made you free from the bonds of the law and stand fast in that liberty. And we as Christians have liberty. Now, again, because we preach grace and not law, because we preach relationship and not rules and regulations, 
Folks are afraid and they say, if you teach people the grace of God and liberty in Christ, they're going to use that as an occasion to live um, a sinful lifestyle. And they're going to take advantage of that. And Paul says, God forbid. And, and, and that that is not what you find in folks that fall in love with Jesus. When we fall in love with Jesus and we relate to Jesus in relationship and through grace, it doesn't lend itself to us taking advantage and abusing the grace of God. And then again, Paul, Paul reminds us in verse 13 of chapter 5, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only, listen, do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Now again, um, Galatians is like a mini Romans. In the book of Romans, again, Paul is dealing with this um, in great detail, in much more of an intellectual approach. But all the way through the book of Romans, you get the same type of nuggets from Paul that are kind of miniaturized here in Galatians. For freedom, you have been set free. Um, these ideas that, that we have liberty and don't use our liberty for an occasion to sin. Paul unpacks those things um, in the book of um, Romans. He, in, in Romans chapter 7, Paul is describing the battle that, he, that he's going to describe here beginning where we, we're going to pick up tonight in verse 16. This battle that we fight between the flesh and the blood. Um, the flesh and the, and the spirit, I mean. And again, when I say your flesh, I'm not necessarily talking about your skin and your bones and, you know, literal flesh. It's, it's a term that um, is synonymous in the Bible with the world or worldly things or things that are not of the nature of God and your spirit being the nature of God. And so there's this battle. Paul lays that out in Romans chapter 7 in the doo-doo chapter when he says, the things that I I don't want to do, I find myself doing, and the things that I desire to do, those things I don't do. And, and Paul is, is explaining in detail in Romans chapter 7, this battle that you and I all live in as Christians with the flesh versus the spirit. And in, in so many times in your everyday Christian living, everyday life, you have opportunities whether you're going to react in the spirit or whether you're going to react in the flesh. Are you going to deal with that situation based on the flesh or on the spirit? And that's what's laid out here in verse 16. And Paul says, um, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the deeds of the flesh. Now again, if it's a battle, and if the Bible describes it as a battle, and we describe it as a war, that the flesh and the, and the spirit war against each other, Paul says, um, not, not Paul actually, in one of the gospels it says, um, my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. That's, that's the, the age old Star Wars in a galaxy far, far away. The entire, you know, world is, and movies and everything is built around this basic concept of good versus evil. And, and in Christian living, that is the basic battle that we all face is good versus evil. Um, I, I, I taught Sunday school for lots and lots of years. And I would always tell the kids in, in this, in this topic, I, I would say, I heard it one way illustrated this way, and I thought it was really good for kids, and um, maybe it'll work on you guys. But it's, and you've maybe seen the analogy, I think it used to be like Tom and Jerry used to do it, and there would be like a, a little angel um, um, on this shoulder and a little demon on this shoulder, and the, and the demon would be telling you to sin and do bad things, and the angel would be telling you to do good, and, and there was always that battle between good and evil, and, and I heard one pastor describe it as, as you have two dogs that sit on your shoulder, a black dog and a white dog, and, and one is good and one is evil, and, and, um, and, and the dogs fight, and that's your life fighting between good and evil. And then the obvious question is, when the white dog and the black dog fight in your life, which one wins? And the answer is obvious, the one you feed more. And so that's the idea. And that's true of life. That is very true of Christian living. Your, your flesh wins when you, when you sow to the flesh and when, you, um, when you're doing things that cater to your flesh. Fasting is a Christian discipline that is designed to help you in this battle. What is one of the very um, essences of, of, of a fast? It's denying your flesh something so that your spirit will win. It's doing something that, that your flesh gets denied and you're not feeding, in this example, um, the black dog. But the, or the, whatever dog represents bad and, and, and good, so you're feeding the, the white dog. And so when we fast, when we do things um, that, that deny our flesh, anything that denies our flesh for a season is the idea. So Paul also describes this in this chapter and in the next in the concept of sowing and reaping. 
if you if you sow, and, and again, I, I'm I, I don't have very good uh, stock and roots. So some of these ideas when I was a new Christian were, um, I you know when someone said, when I was here a pastor say sowing, I would always think of a needle and thread. That's not sowing. Obviously, you guys know that sowing is when you plant seeds in the ground. Now, the idea of planting a seed is that, is that whatever grows, that eventually it'll produce fruit. But again, sowing and reaping, the concept biblically, um, the way that it works in real life is the way that it'll work in your spirit. For example, if you sow seeds, Paul says, if you sow seeds to the flesh, you will reap of the flesh corruption. You will reap of, if you sow to the wind, you will reap the whirlwind. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap the things of the Spirit. So if we went out today and we took seeds out here in front of the church and we planted some strawberry uh, plants today, we wouldn't come on Sunday and all eat strawberries for church on Sunday, right? We would come on Sunday, we would pull the weeds, we would water, we would fertilize, we would clean, we would toil, we would work. And if we did the discipline of taking care of our plants and watering them and taking care of the weeds and feeding the soil and doing the things, you know, in June we'll be eating strawberries. And so the same thing in Christian living, that, that, that when, we, when we sow to, the, to, to bear fruit, that, that God gives us fruit. And that's the concept. That's the concept in a nutshell. And now Paul says, so how do we do that? How do we um, feed this white dog? How do we live in the spirit and not let the flesh win in this battle that we're in, this war that is Christian living? So Paul tells us, how do you do it? You walk in the spirit. And then we talked about this last week, and so I won't go back into it. But, you know, things that we do where we're sowing to spiritual things. So, again, if you're, you know, if you're pumping into your, 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 your life secular music all the time. And, again, I'm not one that's making the bone that, oh, it's of the devil and the devil. And, like, Waterboy's mom, you know, that everything was of the devil. is the devil. And that, that's... That's, that's not my position on, um, you know, because I, I don't need to make a bone with those secular things. But I, I can tell you honestly that if you're sowing country music, it doesn't have to be bad. You know, some of this stuff is just foul, right? That, that, you know, you, you don't have to. When, like, when I was a kid, when I was in junior high, I went to this church service. And it was, it was back in the day when the guy would take the, the rock and roll music and he would play the album backwards and scratch it. And he would say, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was a vibe record and the guy I was in a service one time and this guy had all these pictures and he was showing like all these old 70s and 80s rockers and and this one guy I think it was Fleetwood Mac and and he was on stage and he was freaking out and he had this like um violin thing in his hand what do you call a violin the bow and, and he was going like this on the stage and and the guy was like then the, the pastor guy in this service has he, he showed where the, this is a very, very specific cultic practice. You go to the east, and then you go to the north, and you go to the west, and then you go to the south, and, and, and where certain pagan practices were using this to summon demons, and, and he sees Fleetwood Mac doing it on stage. But in those days, again, then he would take the vinyl albums, and they would play them backwards for these subliminal messages. And I'm like, nowadays, obviously, you don't have to play it backwards to get the message. You play it straight and forward, and it's as foul and is, and is way more rotten than it used to be in the 70s when you had to play it backwards to get the devil message out of the song. But again, so, so, but, but again I'm, I'm, my point is this. If you sow those things into you, they're not feeding your spirit. You know, worship music, uplifting music, music that you're praising God as you're singing it, that you're, you're, you're thinking about Jesus, you're encouraging. Those are things that are sowing to your spirit. And so we want to be careful. And, and it is very true that, you know, garbage in, garbage out. And that's just the truth. And listen, those things work, whether they have, uh, uh, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, oh, you know, if you've ever listened to a secular song, it's of the devil and it's not Christian. Like, that's not what I'm saying at all. We all, I think at times, you know, will have a secular song or a thing. And that, that, but on a regular basis, if you never change the dial to something that's uplifting and all you ever put in is, you know, your, your tear and your beer because I'm crying for you, dear. And you know what happens? You know, when you, ha when you play rock and roll music backwards, then it's some satanic 666 devil music. You know what happens when you play country music backwards? You get your truck back and your sweater back and your cat back. Yeah. So, but, and, and again, you know, some of that stuff, I don't know, and some of it you got to be so careful with. There, there's, there, it's so subtle at times, and, and I don't mean to be picking on this stuff, really, honestly, I don't. But there's a song, I heard it um, recently, and it's Jesus in a John boat. 
and and the and the song like has talks about being baptized and I found Jesus in a John boat and and a John boat is a fishing boat and he was on a Sunday morning and you guys can look it up if you want Jesus in a John boat it sounds really good the guy sounds like Morgan Wallen or something really cool like like new country voice and really well done song um but but at the end of it I, when it was all done I was like he was talking about I'll get baptized on the river on a Sunday morning with the bass and his fish and his John boat and and, and a lot of Christian words and isms in it. But basically, the, the, the message of the song is, I, I don't need to go to church. That I find, I find my God, my whatever, I need to call it Jesus, but my God, my religion, I can find that out in my fishing boat on Sunday mornings, is basically what he's saying in the song. You know, but it sounds all Christian. It sounds all great. You know, but anyways, so... You sow to the Spirit, you reap to the Spirit. So again, we pour into the Spirit, and, and I have encouraged you guys and tell them blue in the face, right? This is the thing that, that, that I make a mantra, is doing devotions in your life, right? Seeking God on a regular basis, being people that read the Word for yourselves, making sure that, that, that Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings is not the only Bible that you're getting. Make sure that you're not only getting Bible from me. Find other podcasts, find other Bible teachers you like, um, you know, because you live close to this church, you're kind of stuck with me as a local church, and you should be a part of a local church, but you're not stuck with only my teaching. There, You have a million sermons right here in your pocket, so you have no excuse to get good teaching. If my teaching is bad or it doesn't connect with you, come to church because you need the fellowship, but then you can podcast all you want and get all the messages you want. And listen, it's just a reality. I have specific pastors and teachers that I just connect with. I just like their style. Um, it ministers to me, I, and it really works for me. You know, I have other pastors that, you know, Lydia really digs and likes this guy's teaching. Nah, 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 not into it. It doesn't make it bad or good or, you know, it, it means that, that we're just going to connect with some, some other teaching people the other way. Now, I encourage you to find people that are teaching the Bible chapter by chapter, verse, verse by verse. But there's great Bible teaching out there. Um, and you have, again, no excuse. You any chapter in the Bible, you go to YouTube and you type in chapter in the, 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 the book and the chapter, you'll find 20 different pastors teaching that chapter or that verse. I particularly, again, I do tend to, to lean towards Calvary guys, and I like to find guys that, and I've been outside Calvary with other teachers, other great communicators um, out there. But when it comes to Bible teachers, I just personally prefer the Calvary guys. But um, some, of these, some of these pastors that I find online that I like, that I listen to, are phenomenal communicators. These guys just, you can listen to them for hours upon hours because they're just easy to listen to and they're, and, and they're spiritual. They're just not, that's just not their, their lane. It's okay. I, I'm not asking them to be in my lane. Their lane is, is, is communicating a, a topical message that they're really good at. And, and I love listening to those guys too, but when it comes to just looking for some teaching, I usually try to find somebody that has taught Genesis to Revelation, every chapter, every verse, and, and those are usually the guys I'll trust on doctrinal issues. And just happens to be that most of the guys you find out there that have archived the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation, happen to be Calvary Chapel guys. Um, but you have no excuse, right? So, oh, Pastor, can you get to heaven? Well, my Pastor Chris, he, he didn't teach the Bible very good. I just connect. Well, Jesus, God said, did you have an iPhone? Didn't you live in 2023? I'm sorry. Chris is off the hook, man. And you had an iPhone in your pocket. All right. So uh, we covered the bad list last week. Um, so we just get to cover the good list this week. So just to go through it really quickly, verse 17. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. What is this? This is the two dogs. This is the two, the fight. This is the Tom and Jerry, angel and a demon. Verse 18. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. And then in verse 19, for the works of the flesh, and we went through them last week kind of briefly. I picked on a couple that, that, that I thought were important to talk about. But um, the works of the flesh are evident. Idolatry, that's having an affair when you're married. Fornication is having any sex outside of marriage. So it's all covered under fornication. Um, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, Outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, bad, bad Bible teachings um, that are heretical, envy. I, I kind of laugh at murder because it doesn't say murder. It says murders, like you just can't have one, like murders. 
And then drunkenness, we talked about that last week because that's kind of a subtle sin. That's kind of a, a, a sin that um, is kind of accepted culturally among Christians. And again, is there's liberty in Christ um, for having a drink, but there's not liberty in Christ for getting drunk. The Bible forbids drunkenness and doesn't necessarily forbid all alcohol in your life. I can't make a case for that. But again, it's, it's a thin line. But it does seem to be an area, and why I kind of spent time on that one, is because it does seem to be an area where we as Christians can struggle a little more. Um, I, I wouldn't worry about um, anybody in this room and how many people you've murdered recently. But, you know, drunkenness is something that, that, could, that could probably more commonly trip us up. Um, so be, again, I, I warned you guys, I encouraged us as a church to, to be on guard for those things. Um, revelries and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past. And I did mention this. And, and again, don't quote me on this because I'm not being exact, but more in general, I think five to seven. I think I've used a couple of numbers, five, six, seven. But this list is repeated, let's call it five for tonight, five different times in the New Testament and then Paul says as much here. I've told you before. I've told you. I'll tell you again. He, he says that right here um, in verse 21. As I told you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the, the, the catalyst here, it says drunkenness. Um, we have, I have been drunk before in the past. I'm going to heaven. So it doesn't mean if you've ever committed one of these things. That, so the biblical teaching is that those who practice or live a lifestyle of unrepentant sin. So if you're an adulterer or a fornicator um, and you're living in that lifestyle unrepentant, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you're the thief on the cross and you lived your life committing these entire sins and you repent, you're going to heaven. So it's repentance. It's unrepentant sins. Revelries. Um, the, the word is used in the King James uh, a, a little bit different, but part of the uh, revelries can mean partying uh, and just kind of like licentious, licentious lifestyles. But revel, reveling is also just like it means. It's reveling in sin. It's the attitude that says, well, I, I can do that if I want. God understands. Like, I, I just, I, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not going to stop. I don't have to stop. God, 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 me and God, we're like this, you know, like he gets it. He's not going to be mad at me or whatever. He'll forgive me. You know, that's kind of the idea of where you're sinning and you're just aloof about it. You're unre you're not repentant. You're not convicted by it. That's, that's a sin that um, the Bible says will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay. Now I get to get to the good stuff. Okay. But the fruit now we have two things that are in contrast. Number one is the works verse 19. You notice works is plural in 22, but this is the contrast. Now those are the works of the flesh, but the fruit and the fruit here is singular. So the fruit of the spirit is love. Now, um, some might disagree. I have some pastors who would agree with me on this point. I think some might disagree. Um, but I've heard good pastors teach it this way, and I like it this way, that, that this list is singular. The fruit of the Spirit is love, period. And then love is explained and manifested in these other attributes of um, the fruits of the Spirit. So the fruit of the Spirit is love. It says, if you go back to verse 14, look at what verse 14 says. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. What? You shall love the neighbor yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Um, Paul says in, a, in another place, I think in Romans, again, all the law and the prophets. No, Jesus said this. Jesus said this in the Gospels. Jesus said, all the law and the prophets is fulfilled in this one word, love. And, and so we, all the law and the prophets, that's a huge statement coming out of Jesus' lips. All the law and the prophets is fulfilled in this one thing, love. And so here Paul says the same thing. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, love is manifest itself in, in these attributes. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So, so there, there's no... The, there's nothing, there's nothing that binds us law-wise to, um, to the law of Moses, the Old Testament, to these Judaizers, to circumcision, to um, kosher laws, to Sabbath laws. None of those things bind us. It, it is all fulfilled and completed in one um, idea, which is love. Now, I say this often, and again, I want to be kind of known for this, that um, if everything that 
that, that I do as a pastor, everything that we do as a church in, in you know, systematically teaching the word of God, in, in having, you know, particular eschatological opinions and teachings and, and everything that we do in our church. But listen, if what we're doing in, in our sanctification... Now, everybody should be familiar with the word sanctification by now. Sanctification is the process of becoming more Christ-like from the time you got saved to the time you meet Jesus. You're in a process called sanctification. It's, it's you becoming set apart, becoming more like Christ. It says in 1 Thessalonians that the will of God for your life is your sanctification. It's the process by which we grow. Now, um, in our sanctification, as we're being sanctified, if what's not happening through our church, through our Christianity, is that we're, the result is not that we're becoming more loving than, than we are doing it wrong. We are missing it. Now again, we, we as churches, guilty as a pastor, we fight over doctrinal differences, over who's got the right eschatology, what's the right rapture theory, where's the all millennium, post millennium, this, all this stuff, and we all have an opinion, and we want to fight about it, and you know, but all that stuff is secondary, right? That's what I shared last week, that, that we should have a, a, a good doctrinal position. The Bible tells us to know how to defend our faith, to know, um, you know, where we stand on biblical issues. But those are not, those are not the, the goal of studying the Bible, of getting up in the morning, spending time with Jesus. What should be happening is we should be becoming more loving, right? That's the goal of Christians. By, by your love one for another, by this they'll know you're my disciples. Jesus didn't say by your correct theological or doctrinal positions in eschatology. That's not it. It's love. You know? And, and, and so, again, we need to make sure that we're growing in love. Are you grumpy all the time? Are you have no joy in life? Those are issues that, that, are, that are more important than, you know, what, what Bible study is correct in some of those things that are not essentials and then again one of the things we point out now i already did it so i'm, I'm out of time you guys i apologize i was going to take you to first corinthians 12 I, I did take you to first corinthians 12 and sometimes when i when i was growing up as a christian i had certain things that i got confused and so when i come to teach them i assume that you guys are also confused but you're not you have it all figured i mean you, know, you have it figured out i'm the one that was confused and so I, I had a hard time when I was first a Christian um, confusing the fruit of the Spirit with the gifts of the Spirit, okay? So the fruit of the Spirit is singular. Fruit in your life is a result of abiding in Christ. You don't produce fruit. You don't produce love. You don't just act more loving. You, you, you grow closer to Jesus and fruit is born naturally. Fruit is a result of abiding in Christ. The gifting of the Holy Spirit, those are those things that we read, that list we read in 1 Corinthians. The gifts are different. The gifts are given to each one of us individually, as the Holy Spirit wills, for the edification of the body. And so not to confuse those two different ideas. Now, I want to say, the, the, the Bible says here, in, 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 and all of us as Christians, you should know cold Galatians 5.22. For the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then if you know the rest of the list, even better. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, at least know that much. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. These are, these are all things that in our Christian living that, that we should display or we should have or should be the fruit that God is putting in our lives. Now, I do want to just say this, that this is not the only thing the Bible talks about um, that's fruit in the life of a Christian. Not, this is not a, a comprehensive list because the Bible says lots of things. In Romans 6.22, it says that holiness is a fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the fruit that God gives us, um, not a gift of the Holy Spirit right? A fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, not to be confused with the gifting of the Holy Spirit, okay? Romans 1.13 says that, that soul winning is a gift. I'm sorry, not a gift, a fruit. In Galatians 5 here, it says love is, is, is a gift, a fruit. I'm trying not to confuse you guys by being confusing. 
In Romans 15, it says giving is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, which means something that, 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 you, that you get by abiding. As you abide in Christ, um, God will begin to put on your heart and, and giving will become more natural, It'll become easier, and you'll do it. Um, Colossians 1.10 says that good works is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Um, and again, good works, relationship drives works. In Hebrews 13.50, it says that praise and worship is a fruit in your life. Now again, um, this is what Jesus, Jesus, you know, when, when Jesus said that we're not to judge other people, again, I've, I've unpacked this already, right? That the world, the way the world understands that verse is, it's meaningless because it's just totally unbiblical and not right. So I don't want to get caught up in that. Oh, you can't judge me. That, that's not even what Jesus said. We have to judge. We make judgments. Jesus said don't make unrighteous judgments. And really to the point of it, don't judge somebody's salvation. You don't know who's going to heaven and hell. That's not, that's not your position. But we all make decisions all day. The world makes, deci- or makes judgments. You know, we're not to make unrighteous judgments. But we have to judge people. We're told to, to, to pick good friends. In order to pick good friends, I got to make judgments on, on, on certain things about, about things, right? And so, um, so what people can see in your life is fruit. You can't fake it. Do you, does your life show fruit? Can other people look at you and see that you're a Christian based on the fruit that's in your life? And I list the things that are Christian fruit, right? These are things that, that become evident to people. When people look... You know, and, and so we want to produce fruit. And again, if you want to produce fruit in your life, I don't know where your garden is in the process, but just stay in that garden, right? Sow to the Spirit. Walk in the, walk in the Spirit. Sow to the, sow to the Spirit, not to the flesh. Invest in spiritual things in your life and do it for a season and God will begin to add fruit or, or, or you know, fruit will remain in your life as a Christian. And that's, that is the goal. Jesus said, if your life is not bearing fruit, that he will prune you or he will cut you off, cut that part of your life off and throw it in a fire. Neither one of those are pleasant, to be pruned or to be burned. And, 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 and apart from bearing fruit, that's what Jesus said he's going to do. So we, we want to bear fruit. And, and again, if you want to eat strawberries in June, then you better plant a seed yesterday. Amen? Father God, we thank you and we praise you, Lord Jesus, for Galatians chapter 5. And uh, Lord, what, what an amazing lesson this is, Lord, in the word. And we pray, Father, that we would bear fruit, that the fruit in our lives we understand is a result of us abiding in Christ, not to be confused with the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are given to each one individually, as you will. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. And there are other fruits of the Spirit that we see um, all throughout the New Testament, God. And, and Lord, we want to bear fruit for you. You said, Jesus, that, that, it's, that we're to bear much fruit. And that you prune us so that we much will we, that we will bear fruit, and so God, we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I, I should probably just read these real quick. Can I just read them? I won't comment on them. Twenty-four and 20, 25 and twenty-six. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. I'll just make one quick comment. Crucify. You don't reform. You don't cage. You crucify. You crucify the flesh is the prescription. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Amen. God bless you guys.